don't hear it. Okay. Huh? Bad? I mean, is it bad? Okay. I mean, it's orange. Don't listen to it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, the furnace is going. That may be what's, and it may be the fan. Is that better? I'm oh, it's not better. Okay. All right. We'll do, we'll just live with it this Sunday, and I'll try to tweak it next week. I don't know. Well, I turned the volume down a little. That's still okay. All right. Okay. Well, this morning we're going to continue studying from First Peter. We've been in chapter 2 for a while. We're moving along slow and steady, but there's a lot to unpack here. And this particular section of Peter that we're in is so applicable to our lives, um, specifically in our relationships and, and how we react and, and conduct ourselves and how we speak uh, is very important. Um, we, we're we're going to talk specifically about our, <laughs> it's kind of ironic, our conduct in the workplace, um, showing ourselves as being slaves to masters, uh, those that are just and unjust, okay, free or or not free. Um, so that 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 once I think you sort out the fact that they're talking about a whole different cultural setting than us, but it's still very applicable to us in our work environments today. Um, I, I think about the the parable parable that Jesus told uh, in the Gospels where the uh, master comes to the town square for, for workers at 8 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning. And he, and he selects some to come to the field and they make a, a deal for one denarii, a day's wages. And that it wasn't enough. They come back at noon and he select more workers and they made a deal for one denarii. And it still wasn't enough laborers. There's still guys sitting around. So he gathered them up and took them in the fields 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Still the same deal, one denarii. Well, five o'clock, shift was over, come time to line them up and pay them, and they all got paid the same. <coughs> Some of them were indignant because they had worked all day for their wages, and the other guys had worked half a day for their wages, and some of them had only been there a short while and got the same wages. And, and the master points out, hey, didn't we have a deal? What, was there some problem? I mean, was there a misunderstanding? Am, am I not able to make whatever deal with you we agree upon? And, and the point was then that in that specific parable that the Jews were the ones that had uh, been the nine o'clock workers. And these Gentiles were, were just come along and they're going to get heaven just like the Jews. Okay, that was, that was the whole point. But I think of that in a practical sense, though, especially in the workplace, because so many times as an employee... We, we sign a contract or an agreement with, with an employer and somebody else doing the same job negotiates a different contract. And, and I found this to be very true as a manager over the years of people that when word gets out that wages or benefits are different and the jobs are comparable, there's unhappiness. It's hard to justify that sometimes as an employer. But if you're not happy with your agreement, then say so in the beginning. Because this life's all about contentment, right? And if you're not happy, you, you go and find contentment. Or you renegotiate. Or, or you do whatever you need. But it, it's such an unfair and unchristian thing to complain about something that you've agreed to in comparison with the deal the other guy got. Okay, that's, that's not a good, a good um, manner of conducting ourselves in the workplace. But that's not specifically what Peter's talking about here. That's just one of the things that came to my mind as I was thinking about this text this morning. Um, we're going to read uh, verses 13 through 25 
of 1 Peter chapter 2, but we're going to spend most of our time this morning in verses 18 through um, 21. Submission to authority. Be subject, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. And remember, that's our key verse for this whole sub- this whole section on being subjective is our actions and our words should be should be such that it puts to silence foolish people that it would accuse us otherwise. In other words, we're to be above reproach. We're to take the words out of their mouths. We're to muzzle them like animals so they can't falsely accuse us because if they do, everybody will know they're liars. Okay. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Honor everyone is, again, not an an exclusive, or, or not an inclusive term, but it's exclusive. We are to honor everyone. Even if they don't honor us back, we are to show them honor. They are God's creation. In his image, just like we are. And he values them and he loves them like he values us and loves us. And that's tough when we don't get honor in return. You know, we want respect. I'm going to get my respect, right? Maybe not. And when you don't, how are you going to respond? Hatefully? So I say sometimes the best thing best thing we can do as Christians when we're in a situation that is beyond our help is to just smile and walk away. Just remove yourself from the situation. And if they yell at you as you're walking away, so what? You know? We have the power to remove ourselves from the situation when we can't do any good. Okay, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. How many of you have worked for a hard boss? Oh, surely there's a lot of experience in this room. Two people, three people, four people. I've been very blessed. Five. The hardest one. Now, now, Nick, you didn't work for your dad a little bit. Well, yeah. That don't count. Oh well, my my dad was one of my hardest bosses. That's because I was one of his hardest employees. My dad was off. Oh, so was mine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but we we know we know what. Peter's talking about when he talks about the good and gentle, and we know what he talks about when he means the unjust. Okay, Some people that are in a position of authority are in that position purely for the money. And I'm going to say that's 90% of most of the supervisors in this world are in it because they have that education and they want paid. They have the experience and they want paid. Money, money, money. And think about it. That's that's the way of our culture. That's the way of the world. You want yours, go get it. And how do you get it? You get the most out of your people. How do you get the most out of your people? Depends on your leadership style and how they respond. But then there are some leaders who just want power. That's right. They don't care about the money. They want the power. Yeah. But, but for most generalities... Power and money kind of are tied together. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going I'm to share that video with many of you that Gene shared with me. That term elite or world elite, it's got a very significant term. That is a very significant term in the world we live today. And, and you'll see that. So we're to be subject to our masters, regardless of how 
their leadership style plays out in the workplace, regardless of how they treat us, we're to be subject to them. Now, they treat you in a fashion that that uh, puts you making a choice between being respectful to them or being respectful to God. It's just the same as your position in being respectful to the rulers or the emperor or the police. Those are all extensions of God's right hand. But when they cross the line and invade on your mission, okay, then that's different. But in all legalities of this world, we're to be sub subject to them. And why? Verse 19. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, not mindful of ourselves, but mindful of our God, one, that being us, endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Did you know that Jesus is known as a man of sorrows? Was he treated unjustly? Did he like it? I doubt it. Well, why did he do it? All the while in his ministry, he did everything for the will of his Father. What he spoke, what he did, it was all for the Father. That's a gracious thing. What's it mean to extend grace to somebody? Unmerited favor. So when you don't react harshly to a harsh employer, you're showing them grace. And why are you doing that? Because God wants you to. Not necessarily because you want to, because God wants you to, because that's what He's called you to do. That's His will for you in the workplace. You are to be an example as Christ is an example for you, as we'll see. For what credit is it if, when you sin, you are beaten for it, you endure? But when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. It's easy to get along and be gracious to somebody that's treating you right. It's a hard thing to get along and be gracious to somebody that's pushing your buttons, being harsh to you, being critical to you. Okay, That's, that's hard. For this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, cussed out, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherds and overseers of your souls. So, all of us, except for Nick, have served in some capacity as an employee being supervised by someone else. So we know that side of the coin. How many of you have supervised other employees? You know that side of the coin too. Okay, so this is just as important if you're currently in that position to you as an employer as it is to those who are prospective employees. Bailey's in the transition. She might go right into the boss thing and never, you know, have to be, you're going to have an superior, I'm sorry, but you're going to probably be a boss from the get-go. But, but remember these words as you conduct yourself with other people. Same way with you, Claire, in four or five years. You guys are going to enter into the workplace with an education and a specialty. So you're going to be favored and highly thought of to manage other people that need to learn those skills. So how are you going to treat those people? How are you going to endure with a boss that says, I need 80 hours from you this week? No exceptions. 
cannot be off Saturday. I will not let you off Sunday morning. Where are you going to draw the line? How are you going to react? That's the thing we're talking about here. So verse 18, let's go back to the beginning of our section. Again, that big phrase, be subject, be subject, servants be subject. My study Bible says one's Christianity does not give the right to rebel against one's superior in the social structure, no matter how unfair or harsh the superior may be. So let's look at some examples. Uh, you got your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Normally I would have these all ready for you, but I went to a ball game yesterday. <laughs> so you're going to have to flip your pages. Okay? Go past the Gospels, go past Romans, and you will hit 1 Corinthians. You've got to go past Acts 2. Sorry, I skipped that one. I consider that sometimes like part of the Gospels because it's the second half of Luke. It's a continuation of the story. Although Jesus has ascended and went into heaven, now it's about Jesus' work continuing for it through the apostles and through us, the church. So 1 Corinthians 7.21 Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you gain your freedom... Avail yourself to the opportunity. For he who has called you in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man in the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called a bondservant of Christ, you were bought with a price, do not become bondservants of men. So here's what he's telling you. Worker or boss, worker or boss, bondservant is worker, superior is boss, regardless of your position, be Christ-like. Remember who truly is the boss. Remember who truly is the example. And don't allow yourself to become a slave to men because you were ransomed. Your price was paid by Christ. You're His, first and foremost. All right. So, now, as I told Ronnie and I told, I think I told Jill, Okay, I didn't get a chance to call Nick and Connie, but when I when I started this process of looking for something different to do other than Sunday, when I talked to the recruiters and they say, "What are you looking for?" I say, "I said first of all, priority number one, I need to be in Unionville on Sunday morning." Half of them that ended the conversation. That's just the world we live in. Okay, so so I couldn't be one of those out two weeks or out three weeks guys. Okay, and a lot of them were looking for that, and that's the big money, and that's where you make a lot of you know over a hundred thousand dollars as a truck driver. Okay, so 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 when we choose our professions, you need to consider that. What what is your priority? Don't allow yourself to become a slave to man, and and from the get go, you have to do that. You have to let people know who you are from the get-go. Now, in this day and age, that's not always looked on favorably. I, I lost half of my opportunities because I told them who I was from the get-go. You know, and I followed that up with, I'm also a minister, so it's important. And that's usually how I put it to them. I need to be in Unionville on Sunday morning. And a lot of them said, oh, that's great. We can work with that. We appreciate that. And some of them say, oh, I just don't have that for you. So, you know. That's going to that's gonna weed out some of your opportunities, but you're choosing. Next, next section is Ephesians chapter 6. So start flipping through the epistles and you'll hit Ephesians right around Galatians. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Bond servants, employees, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere with a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service and people pleasers. And what does that mean? Don't be a brown noser. 
don't show them a smile to their face and then turn around and go, okay, none of that. None of that. But as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering services, whatever your skills are, with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. So you are to view this as if you're employed by God. As if God's the one signing your paycheck. And we all know, when you get right down to it, where does the provision come from in the first place? Where does the opportunity come? Where does the reward come? And, and He allows the suffering too. But the provisions come from God, so He might as well be the one signing your check. Okay. Doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Employee or boss, you do it as if God were paying you in this lifetime, your reward in heaven is going to be good. Okay, You're going to have a 100% match 401k in heaven. I think everybody knows what that means, right? You buy into the company, you own the company. You have stock in the company, you have investment in the company. Best deal I found was 7% and 7%. Guess where that was? Lucerne. It's the best deal I found as far as the retirement match goes. Lucerne, Missouri. Worked there before too, by the way. Okay, so, so we need to keep our eternal spectacles on and look through them in this life with that vision, knowing that what we're doing now is, is putting into that 100% match 401k in heaven. That's where our reward truly lies. How many people do you know that work their whole life, they retire, Lord calls them home immediately? Gobs. Now, we don't think that'll happen to us. Might, kind of likely, you know, your your genetics are going to have some something to say about it. But when God's ready to bring you home, you're not going to say, "Oh, wait a minute, Lord." You know, I, I I've got plans to, you know, sit on a beach in Maui and have a margarita next year. Mm. If, if God said, "No, we've got you fully vested. It's time to come home. You're coming home." Colossians 3, you don't have to go very far, Colossians 3, 22 through 25. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service or people, as, people, as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not to men. What do you think Paul means when he says work heartily? What kind of work ethic do you think he has in mind for us? Joyfully. Joyfully? I think he's telling us not to be lazy. Work heartily. Get after it. See what you can accomplish. Draw the boss's attention to you. Why is that beneficial? Because you get the good stuff. You get the promotions. Okay, and, and if you're doing it with the right heart, God gets more glory. Okay, Work heartily. As for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. I was losing my vigor in the management sector. Time to do something else. Because if I'm losing my vigor, 
I'm not being as productive as I can be. I'm not being as motivated as I can be. I'm not working heartily. Okay? Just being just being honest. Okay? So so the wrongdoer would be the person who knows that they're not working as to the Lord. The person who knows they're not working heartily. That would be the wrongdoer. That's being guilty of sin. You know, not, not doing what you're supposed to do. And it says, we'll be paid back for the wrong he has done. And say, wait, God, I'm your preacher, man. No partiality. I'm going to treat you just like I treat every other child of mine that calls Jesus their Lord. The reward may be different, but I'm going to treat you the same. You're not my favorite just because you're behind the mic. It's not how it works with God. So, I think it's neat when we look at the New Testament and see what Paul and the apostles have to say about these subjects. To go back to the Old Testament and look at how God dealt with the Israelites. Because all they had ever known was slavery and oppression. They didn't know how to live free. Generations, 400 years of people had only known slavery. And those who walked out of Egypt, whether they were young or old, that's all they had ever known. So God's taken these people that are incredibly worldly naive, except in all things Egypt, and putting them out in the desert, millions of them, to be led by one prophet and priest, Moses the prophet, Aaron the priest. We talk about a tough assignment. And, and they were, well, Moses was 80 when he started this great ministry. How would you like to be 80 and be called to lead millions of people out into the desert without any prospect of food or shelter? It says Moses was the most humble man on the earth. It would take that kind of person, wouldn't it? Humility is not a bad thing. Humility is a very good thing. To be humiliated, that's not so much fun. But when we are humble and understand what humility is as we live it out, it's a very great thing because people respond to that. There was a kid last night, even in warm-ups, I picked him out. I said, what an arrogant kid. I hope he fouls out. You know which one I'm talking about. Okay? It, was just, it was just obvious to me. He was the best player on the team, but he knew it too. You know? and, and those kind of people put off that kind of energy and aura, and, and we just automatically have reservations and, well, bad feelings about them. Okay? And we don't want to be that kind of person because we are supposed to be sharing the gospel and encouraging other people to develop a relationship with Jesus. If we're arrogant and they're turned off, what kind of chance do we stand? Very little. So Moses was the most humble man. Very important, I think, for him to deal with all those people. I, I, I've been listening to the Torah uh, in the bus before the kids get on and after the kids get off. And I got a little speaker there and I punch it up. So I'm getting about two days worth of my daily Bible reading every day that way, listening to it. And it's so interesting when Moses is confronted with these guys like, like Korah and, and Dathan, and they come and they start accusing him. How does he react? He falls flat on his face in front of them. He doesn't yell them down. He falls flat on his face and tears his clothes and he weeps and he, and he sobs. Incredible. Exodus 21 where we're going to start, Exodus 21, 26 through 27. And I want you to keep in mind this is God dealing with very raw people, trying to control them, trying to help them live among one another without killing each other. Exodus 21. You're all familiar with this. This is still a popular mantra in the world. When a man strikes the eye of his slave male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go free because of his eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his slave, 
male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. Okay, we understand that in the context of the Israelites. Eye for an eye mentality for a little bit. But this, this was particular to those that were in subjection as slaves. And that, that was a common part of, of the lifestyle. But I think how it applies to us now is if we're in the boss category, and we do wrong to our employees, we, we are liable to them. We are liable to them in some way. If we do wrong to our employees, we need to own it. Whether that means asking for forgiveness, writing the situation, whatever that may be. If you're a boss and you do wrong to your employee, intentionally or unintentionally, you need to own it and make it right. Okay? Because if you don't, and there are several employees, and they see what happens... You're going to have a reputation. If they don't see what happens, that employee is going to tell them, and you're going to have a reputation. And you're going to have problems in the workplace, and you're not going to be a very effective boss anymore. I know this to be true firsthand, because I've experienced it both ways. When I worked for my dad, I was a very immature boss. When I worked for the school, I would learned a lot of lessons. And I came into that with a lot more maturity and understood the importance of being hum humble and owning the, trans owning the transportation department with a we factor and not an I factor. Okay, it was ours. We were, we were a team. I was just a team leader. But I was open to suggestion. You know, I think everybody that worked for me in the transportation department knew that they could come to me with anything. And we would work it out. Right? So when, when you're a boss, identify it as being the leader of the team. Not the eye that rules over the slaves, because you're going to get nowhere. Um, next section in the Old Testament, Leviticus. Everybody loves Leviticus chapter 25. Now I want you to, I want you as we read this together, to think about this from the perspective of our church family. Our greater church family, Christians, okay, in our community, in our county, in our state, in our country. If your brother, verse 39, if your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and a sojourner. Remember what a sojourner is? It's that person that is alongside, living alongside of someone else. <clears throat> there we go. He shall serve you, he shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. I'm not going to go into all that, but if you want to, if you have some time and you want to do some study this week and understand that concept that, that God had ordained among those people, just Google the year of Jubilee. Okay, and, and it's just fascinating. I just I've, I've I've studied that, and I think, man, wouldn't it be cool if the United States was set up on that kind of thing? It would just be incredible. It would be unlike anything anybody has ever known since the year of jubilee. Then he shall go out from you, he and his children with you, with him, and go back to his own clan and return to the possession of his fathers, for they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt, they shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him ruthlessly, but, he, but, shall, but shall fear your God. So, I'm not a boss anymore, but if I was, Jim's hit, hit some pretty hard times, T and Jill, and both lost their jobs, and Kids are being terrible to him, won't help him. Jim comes to me and he said, Would you have an opening to drive a bus? I put him on. Am I going to treat my brother Jim like I would any other employee? Well, in my case, yes, because I try to treat all my employees like family. But the point is here, 
I'm going to treat Jim like brother, even in the workplace. Okay, I'm not going to lord it over him. Okay, because I'm I'm his Christian brother doing him a favor, right? None of that. That's what this is about. Helping each other without there being any attitude or favors involved. Okay. Deuteronomy 23:15. Twenty three, fifteen, and 16. You shall not give up to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. He shall dwell with you in your midst in the place that he shall choose within one of your towns, wherever it suits him. You shall not wrong him. I have a real hard time making a bridge of context between that culture and there and all our culture here in this particular situation. In their culture, imagine a slave who has been mistreated and he escapes from his master and he comes to you. And he becomes your property. And you're gentle and humble and he works well with you and you work well with him and the relationship is good. Lo and behold, his previous master, employer, comes along and says, I had a contract on him. He's mine. That was the circumstance then. Circumstance now, there are so many situations now and how our work environment plays out and contracts and agreements and negotiations and laws and, and insurance and all kinds of garbage. I don't know really how that plays out. But... In these three particular instances of Old Testament employer-employee relationships, I think it's just important here that we see that fairness and, and humility is important in, in dealing with people, especially in the workplace. Especially in the workplace. Now, why do I say that? I say that because that's our circle. That's where we spend a great deal of our life. Um, when, when I talked to Dr. Halley and, and shared with him why I was going to move on, I was worried about that because I was worried about offending him and it not going well. And, and it couldn't have been more gracious. It was, it was great. It was the best. I haven't had a lot of exit interviews, but it wasn't anything that I'd envisioned or prepared myself for. You know, I'm one of those people that play out those scenarios in their mind and talk to themselves. Well, you said this and I said this and blah, blah, blah. And this is what I'm going to do. And that's what, I, you know what I mean? Do you do that? Uh Oh, nobody else does that. <laughs> we all do that. Okay. I'm not crazy. No, I'm not. Okay. But I lost my train of thought. It was, it was, it was a gracious thing. And, and when, when I went to tell him, um, I say it didn't go as I thought. I'm trying to get my thought back here. Sorry. If you've got an idea where I was, speak up. I went in there with the attitude of, I'm not going to respond in a, in a fashion that was unbecoming. I wasn't going to burn any bridges. That's not what I was there to do. And I broke down, there it comes. I broke down my life into 10 year increments, and I explained it this way Tico had two tens of my seven genetically. <laughs> I've got seven tens, genetically speaking, in the Tipton line. Okay, seven tens. Tico got two tens. The school got one. I've got two tens left. I know what I want to do on my last 10. I don't want to ever give this up, but I want to retire on that last 10. I would love to be able to retire on that last 10. But the 10 that I'm beginning to prepare on now, I want it to be as stress-free as can be so I can get to that last 10. <laughs> I, want to have, I want to have joy. I don't want to have dread. 
And I've, I know I put a, a, a million worries in my wife's mind and my daughter's minds about me moving into a different environment. And, and they've all said a similar thing. What if it doesn't work out? It doesn't, it doesn't. But you know the old saying, you know when it's time, it's time. Okay? And if it doesn't work out, I've got a backup plan. If that backup plan doesn't work out, you're going to have to give me a big raise. <laughs> I'm serious. No, I'm just, you know, I'm really trusting God on this, and, and I feel good about that because uh, I won't say who told me, but somebody said, you know, you're going into a job where they're going to treat you like garbage. I am prepared. I have dealt with kids that have treated me like garbage. I've dealt with parents that have treated me like garbage. The, the school has not. They've been great. Always been supportive. Always given me anything I needed. Okay, but I, I, I'm used to being treated poorly. So, like I told my brother Walter Griffin, I am excited about going into the receiving department with the bills in my hand, a Christ-like smile on my face, an attitude coming from me to that grouchy receiving clerk behind the window. You know, good morning, brother. Brother, this. Who knows what they'll do? Okay, I'm ready for that. You know, it's the it's the isolation part that I think scares us all the most. Because Wendy says I can get into my own head, which is incredibly true. It's like that playing out the scenarios, you know, back and forth. I'm good at that. And man, those can get deep, can't they? They really can. And then we get into that situation. It's like. <laughs> wasn't anything like I was prepared for. We always prepare for the worst in our minds. I think that's just the humanity in us. And I, and I hate it that, that we've got to a place in our country and in our lives where we've become cynical. I don't know if I'm the only one. I don't think I am. But that's part of my change in life, too, is because I don't like the cynicism that flows from me so freely. That's not Christ-like. I mean, people ought to see us as joyous people. And so that's part of my reason. So, we got one verse done. The perfection of Christ is our example in all we say and do. Certainly we want that example of attitude and conduct to carry over into our workplace. That should be what we desire. It's literally the work that people will size us up for, how we do that work. What's our attitude about the work? How do we work with others? Do you work in, remember the old, Billy plays well with others, unconditional, un unsatisfactory or satisfactory. I always got the unsatisfactory. How do we want people to think of us? You know, there's a lot to consider in, in what we want to project. Do, do we want them to see us as fair or unfair? Honest or dishonest? Hardworking or lazy? A peacemaker or a troublemaker? Loyal? Or disloyal. And these things matter because they directly affect the validity of our testimony in the workplace. If our attitude is poor, if we give people to think poorly of us in the workplace, who wants to listen to someone about Christ that isn't Christ like? Perfection is what we're aiming for. Jesus said, be perfect. That's what we're aiming for. And when we miss the mark, left or right, up or down, we sin. But our aim is for perfection. Being a Christian, we have an out. Jesus is faithful to us, and He doesn't miss. He's faithful to us, 
and will forgive our trespasses and iniquities. And we must trust Him to do so and not let those mistakes in life, that sin in life that we have, entangle us and drag us down. It's been taken care of. Don't continue to do it. Leave it behind and move forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here this morning in your house. I'm so grateful, Father, for this church, these saints that exemplify Christ in their lives, that are willing to uh, consider, I mean, even consider in this world, consider to be different, to be set apart, to be made holy. It's a tremendous task to take on to try to live out a righteous life in this world well it's impossible and only one person's ever done it right but at least we have the example and at least we have the the ransom price paid for the mistakes we made and will make and we're so grateful father for that sacrifice and we come to this time in our service when we remember whose we are, and why we chose Him. The example He made through His ministry is tremendous. He, there was no sin in Him. He didn't. He, he had a cross word or two, but they were justified. They were proper. They were in context. They weren't hateful. They were honest rebukes of people who needed rebuking. But he was kind and loving and gentle with everybody. When he was stressed out, he removed himself and, and sought solitude and got rid of that temptation of being jaded by all the people that came to him clamoring to be healed and to be made right. And no doubt people wanted to get into his ministry purse and, and all that. What a incredible amount of pressure but he would go off and, and seek a quiet place and and pray privately with you for hours upon time how many of us have that kind of reaction father it's spelled right out for us in scripture but i think very few of us have that kind of prayer life we come to you in times of crisis but usually if we're honest we're on autopilot Father, help us to remove that control from our instrument panel. We shouldn't even have an autopilot button. The way we get away from that, Father, is starting by first of all familiarizing ourselves with your word. Not just being familiar, but being affected by it, by understanding it, by reading it and doing what it says. And then, of course, praying and fellowshipping together as we're doing this morning. Father, help us remember these liberties and these blessings we have as we partake in communion. We remember Jesus on the cross, giving up his life so that we could enjoy all these things. We praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen.